Hello, welcome to another episode of Umineko. Uh, and what an episode it will be. Uh, for real this time, I've been saying this for a while, but we're finally here. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm hyped for every episode, but this one is, is going to be um, interesting. Uh, before we start, Here's our usual content warning. Um, content warning for child abuse, bullying, character deaths, detailed descriptions of gore and body horror, mentions of suicide, misogyny, and some awkward skeeviness, which I don't think will apply here. So that's a plus. Um, there will be some, some bloody scenes in this episode, just so you know. Um, gosh, I hope you're all doing good. I'm hyped. Uh, let's, 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 let's fucking go. Let's see, where did we end up last time? It was here. And I'll, I'll give you a little recap. Um, last time that we actually saw what happened on the token Jima 12 years ago. Uh, on one of the game boards, I should I should say, because we don't know what really, really happened yet. Um, the family had a big, long discussion about whether Kinzo, the head of the family, is still alive or not. Um, Kitty has specifically theorized that he is dead, and Kraus and Natsuhi are covering up his death to maintain access to his, uh, wealth, his money. Um, meanwhile, Dr. Nanjo has been saying Kinzo has three months to live, and has been saying this for about a year now. And nobody's actually, well, outside of the people who live on the island, and the servants, nobody has actually seen him or spoken with him in two years. What happened after that is, Kraus and Natsuhi went to go talk to him, um, he physically assaulted Kraus, beat him up, choked him, but in the end agreed to go meet the family. And that's, uh, what happened last time. That's where we're at. And... <laughs> I'm hyped. Um... <laughs> showing off his godlike physique. Yes, that man must be ripped. Um... I forgot one small thing. I made a little adjustment to the channel point reward that I have up for this uh, series, which used to be Satan Red. I turned it into Satan Blue. So rather than speaking the truth, you can now use it to theorize. To throw your wild theories out there to make puns, as always. <laughs> so yeah, that got a little update. Sadly, you still can't do both, which would be the ideal, you know, but Twitch doesn't like that, so that's still impossible, but maybe in the future. Alright, let's go. It was already approaching 10 at night. By now, the typhoon had wrapped itself around Rokanjima. Even the rose garden, that had looked so beautiful midday, was beaten down upon by the fierce winds and resisted with all its might, undulating and trying to keep the flowers from blowing away. In that rose garden was Shannon in the lead, Battler holding up an umbrella, Jessica and George carrying the sleeping Maria on his back, all heading for the guest house. We can at least make it to the guest, guest house from here. Shannon John, it's fine, you should go back and rest. Don't worry, seeing you off is also part of my duty. The family conference is going on inside, and Mom and Genji-san are probably getting stressed. If we keep you, they'll misunderstand and think you're being lazy. That's right. Just graciously accepting our offer might be the best way to avoid burdening people. Thank you, Shannon. N not at all. Certainly, as Milady has said, it is very tense inside the mansion today. 
Therefore, coming with all of you allowed me a bit of fresh- a breath of fresh air, and I've been able to relax a bit. Family conference, huh? They went to all the trouble of chasing us kids out, so they're probably talking about something shady. Yeah, George is so nice, isn't he? Probably. I'm sure there's nothing we can do to help out. Just trying to stay out of their way is probably the best way for us to be useful. <laughs> I'm sure it's all just money, money, money. Even though they act like they're so rich most of the time, when it gets tough, they all start getting pushy. Why don't they just be graceful and split it evenly between everyone? <laughs> That'd be awesome. It'd be nice if I got a share too. If I got some too, I'd split it with Chen and Chen right away. Thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate the sentiment. Shannon isn't greedy at all. Normally, girls of your age would have tons of things they'd want to buy. I, I guess. But none of the things I want can be bought with money. Oh, how unselfish. If you lined up all the things I wanted, all the gold in the world wouldn't be enough. That's if you're talking about things that can be can be bought with money. I wonder what these things that can't be bought with money that Shannon wants are. Do you have any idea, George Nisa? Uh, well, I, I wonder. I'm not Shannon, so how could I know? Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> You're the one who said it. George and Shannon looked down, their faces red. Battler had also heard about what was going on with them, so he knew what Jessica was teasing them about. George Aniki is a person I respect. I think you've met up with a really great person, Shannon Chan. Yeah. I also feel relieved that we can leave Shannon to George Nissan. <laughs> Stop teasing. It's a serious issue for us. More importantly, what about you, Jessica Chan? Have you been able to get a little closer to Kanonku? What? So, you and Kanonkun are like that? Um, well, th that's dirty, George. Twisting the conversation around like that's dirty. Dirty but effective. As they had an animated discussion with ups and downs, the four kids headed for the guest house. The annual family conference was extremely important to the Ushiromiya family and this year seemed like it was going to be especially important. Apparently, the family head, Kinzo, was personally going to be making a very serious announcement, and everyone other than the adults had been strictly ordered to leave. Battler hadn't attended the family conference in six years, so he didn't really notice. But according to Jessica, there seemed to be a very tense atmosphere tonight, completely different from a normal year. Common sense made it clear that Kinzo, this remaining life was short, was going to make some big announcements about the succession of the headship and the distribution of his fortune. But I'm surprised to think that Grandfather's actually going to make an appearance. I see. So, this is the witch's counterattack. <laughs> I wanted to leave the Joker called Kinzo face down a little longer, but it's probably about time to turn it over. Trump cards exist to be used. <laughs> ah, damn. My theory that Grandfather was dead since the beginning, and a different 18th person had snuck in, is now suddenly torn apart. I had foreseen that you'd begin to doubt Kinzo eventually. Yes, now your reasoning has all gone back to square one again, right? With this, your theory that Kinzo was dead at the very beginning and I was hiding as the 18th person goes poof. <laughs> Fuck. But no way I'll lose heart. That's only one theory gone. I'll attack you like a storm. Like a tornado. <laughs> I'd have it no other way. Even the first twilight has not yet begun. It is far too early to give up. That's right. And it's not like it was denied with the red truth. At this point in time, Battler's theory hasn't been defeated. It's too early to say you've won. Yeah, that's right. 
Still too early for me to just swallow her story. Grandfather is supposed, supposed to finally appear, but there's a chance that they'll talk about how his health has gotten worse and he won't appear after all. Uncle Kraus might be trying desperately to hide the fact that Grandfather really is dead until the last second. <laughs> I see, I see. You could also think of it that way. Do as you please. It will be res resolved soon. Very soon. <laughs> I love her so much. <laughs> I do, I really do. She's so smug, you're right. All of the relatives and Nanjo could be seen in the dining hall. Nanjo sat alone, quietly watching the wind and rain outside. Kraus sat down in the seat of his own rank, Natsuhi standing motionlessly at his side. The other siblings were gathered at the opposite end of the long table, whispering to each other. Is that true? Y yes. Marie said the person who gave her the umbrella was father. What in the world? In other words, words our strategy has collapsed, collapsed from the roots. Not just our strategy. Since father is healthy and has said that he'll make an announcement himself, our trivial bargaining with Nissan was completely pointless. Yep. That old bastard. Why couldn't he have just shown himself right away without making a show of it? Thanks to that, we've just been quarreling with Aniki uselessly. Or, maybe he wanted to test us on that point. I might not, I might not be one to talk, since we aren't related by blood. But your father is very intelligent, correct? Our arguments during the day were probably overheard by one of the servants and reported to father. Incredible. The fact that we were making a fuss with father's inheritance as our goal is now right in the open. <laughs> Just incredible. Ava uncharacteristically held her head, dejected. If, as Kitty had said, everything had gone according to Kinzo's plans from the beginning, and if this was a huge setup that had been kept up for over a year, trying to find the siblings' true intentions, then they had fallen for it completely. We still don't know for sure that it's reached Father's ears. No, it definitely has. Everyone but Nissan claimed that Father was dead, and none of us believed in Father's good help. It's already over. Father will make an announcement. Nissan will become the successor, and he'll say that we aren't even qualified to wear the one wing. Oh, I... Nissan, get a hold of yourself. Rosa-san, I wonder if Maria really re received that umbrella from Father. Huh? What do you mean? Maria-chan might have seen Father. However, we haven't seen him. Maria-chan only claims to have seen him. What are you saying? Are you saying Maria's lying? Calm down, Rosa. Maria-chan didn't necessarily lie. Still, she's an innocent kid, right? For example, if Genji-san came up to her and said, said something like, I was told by your grandfather to hand this to you, Maria-sama, then even if Maria-chan hadn't met Dad, she might still say that she got an umbrella from him, right? Th that's right. That trick could work. But what was it Maria-chan said? Grandfather came and handed me the umbrella. Yes, that's what she said. She clearly said that she received an umbrella directly from Grandfather. Directly, huh? Then we're stuck. They often say that bad thinking is no better than sleeping. If you think about it a bit, all of this about the umbrella is a trivial problem. Why is that? Couldn't Maria-chan have been bribed by Nissan to lie and say something that made it seem like Father was in good health? There's no evidence that father actually handed the umbrella to her. Regardless of whom Maria-chan received the umbrella from, assuming she was even given an umbrella in the first place, father will, will appear very soon. Once father's in front of us, the problem with the umbrella will become completely trivial. In other words, this is not the time to gossip about the umbrella issue. 
What do you mean this isn't the time? I see. I got it. This is probably what Kitty is saying. Father is supposed to come here very soon. But the chance still remains that he'll get mad again and won't shut up, show up, right? I see. That's true. Maybe Nissan just said Father was going to appear at random in a desperate bid to buy time against our investigation. Father really is dead already, and Nissan is still lying and saying that he's healthy. In short, if Father appears, then no schemes will be effective. There's no need to even think about that case. We're fish on the chopping board. We'd have no choice but to leave fate to the heavens and negotiate directly with Father. That means we'd have no choice but to let him clobber us with his fist, then prostrate our ourselves and beg for money. But on the other hand, if Father doesn't appear, then our primary strategy isn't hampered in the least. I see. In short, no matter which way it goes, there's absolutely no need to get flustered now. That's it. If Father shows up, we just have to carry out the normal family conference. If he doesn't, we just have to keep on investigating Krause. We can't let him talk his way out of it. Like if he says Father's mood has suddenly gotten worse. It seems that what we should really be trying to figure out is what scheme Nissan is going to try and trick us with. The way he just doesn't know how to give up is something I know better than anyone. If Father is well, we'll prostrate ourselves and beg for money. If it's a farce of Krausans, then we'll continue our ugly sibling fight. It sounds like this year's family conference is going to be just wonderful. Yep. So, bad thinking is no better than sleeping, huh? It's almost 10pm. Should we press Aniki? Rudolph and the rest looked at Kraus. He was sitting down firmly, and looked like he was awaiting Kinza's arrival with an air of composure. Right, Kitty is so smooth. She's... she's one of my favorites. They couldn't tell if he really was composed, or if he was scheming about how to tie together his lie. D. Calm yourself. We won't get anywhere by making a fuss after all this. Let's leave it to Genji-san. It's almost ten, isn't it? That was the time that had been set for tonight's family conference to open. And it was the time that the Ushiromiya family head needed to appear. Right then, they heard the sound of footsteps approaching from the hall. There were multiple sets. Natsuhi raised her head. Relieved. But because of the sound of a knock, their expression was filled with disappointment. Because Kinzo probably wouldn't have knocked. Please excuse us. I have finished closing up the mansion for the night. It was Goda and Kumasawa. Unlike the powerful Goda, it was rare for Kumasawa, with her old body, to be forced to work this late. Of course, Kraus also seemed to know that. Indeed. Good work. My apologies for making you work at such a time, Kamasawa-san. Oh, it's nothing. I may not look it, but staying up late is still one of my specialties. <laughs> Wouldn't it be okay to at least let Kamasawa leave without being an observer? It really will be difficult on her body, I imagine. The order was to gather all of the servants as well. I cannot disobey. Tonight's family conference was clearly different from normal. On a normal year, no one was allowed to attend except family members. To have the servants present for such a thing was unthinkable. But this year was different. All of the servants were told to attend. Of course, they were not allowed to talk. They were there as observers. Just what in the world was happening that needed to be observed by five servants? Even Kraus didn't know. <laughs> I don't look it, but I'm good at staying up late. If you stuff yourself with mackerel too, kraus you'll be more manly at night. <laughs> I see you're still in high spirits. 
I'm sure you'll be working in such high spirits until you're a hundred. Madam, forgive my ar arrogance, but I have prepared a light snack. I can serve it at any time, so feel free to order it. Thank you. You really are considerate. Please offer refills of coffee to the others. Certainly. After nodding, Goda took the pot towards the relatives gathered at the other end of the table. As he did, more footsteps approached from the hallway. It was a single set, and it was light. Even before the knock, they could imagine who it was. Excuse me. I've taken the children to the guest house. Good work. Tonight is a special evening. Make sure you stay alert. Yes, certainly, madam. Genji had gone with Kanon to meet Kinzo. There was still no sign of their return. The hand of the clock passed ten slightly. Once sure of that, Ava spoke to Kraus. Nissan, it's time. Are you still not going to start the family conference? The arrival of the guest of honor has been delayed. Wait a short while. How long? Sorry, but time's up. I won't have you saying father hasn't quite shown up yet, over and over until dawn. How could I make a promise about the time father shows up? Why are you in such a rush? Why not drink some tea and calm down for now? Aniki, we're gathered here for a family conference, not a farce. We'll wait 30 more minutes. But if that doesn't work, you let us break into the study, okay? Break into... Such an action would be quite lacking in respect for the head. Oh, right. Our apologies. We'll be good for 30 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing if you can keep that same smile up for 30 minutes from now. So, you honestly believe that father is dead? I have no desire to discuss that now. We can wait until father comes here. There's absolutely no need for me to argue you down, Nisan. The Ushiro <laughs> Talking is hard. The Ushiromiya headship will be passed on to the proper person in the proper manner. No matter what you may scheme, you cannot resist. Of course, the same thing goes for me. What are you trying to say? And after bragging all these years about being the su successor yourself? I'll turn your own words back on you. I have no desire to discuss that now. All that matters is for Father to come here and proclaim it with his own mouth. There's absolutely no need for me to argue you down. Right. <laughs> Kraus casually turned Ava's words back on him. Of course, that added oil to Ava's anger. But it didn't ignite. Because in that instant, the sound of a very lo loud knock rang out. Both Kenji and Kanon were usually very reserved when they knocked. They wouldn't hit the door with such a violent strength. It was like a judge's gavel slamming down in a call for silence. So everyone went quiet. I'm going to take a quick sip of water. The door opened slightly, and Genji showed himself. Then, he spoke with a serious tone different from his usual one. It wasn't the tone he used when carrying out his duties. It was the tone he used when speaking for Kinzo himself. So just by hearing Genji speak like that, the siblings were struck with a sudden tension. Take your seats, everyone. At those words, the dining hall was wrapped in total silence, and everyone hurriedly returned the, to their designated seats. It was as though students who had been bustling around just before homeroom had suddenly returned to their seats when the, when the teacher came. And it might even have looked humorous but there was no way anyone would joke about it. Everyone sat in order, 
and Shannon, Goda, and Kamasawa stood up straight in a row by the wall. The head of the glorious Ushiramiya family and Lord of Rokanjima, the island that sparkles gold, Lord Ushiramiya Kinzo, has arrived. Of the double doors that led to the, op the dining hall, Genji opened the right door from the inside, and Kanon opened the left door from the outside. And, welcomed by a respectful bow from those two, majestically fluttering his cape, Kinzo appeared. Kinzo's gait had a dignified way to it, and it was hard to believe that he had reportedly been at the end of his life. Genji pulled back Kinzo's seat and motioned for him to sit. But Kinzo stayed standing, signaling with his chin for Genji to move back. <laughs> Welcome to Rock the Rock Welcome to Rock and Jima, ladies and gentlemen. Why the frightened face, Ava? <laughs> no, why would I be frightened? I'm just relieved to find you in excellent spirits, father. <laughs> Ava, you're as amusing as ever, aren't you? Why don't you just honestly say how frustrated you are at losing your bet with Kraus? <laughs> you can't say it, can you? <laughs> Ava realized that their conversation during the day had indeed been leaked to Kinzo, and she hung her head, turning red. Well then, my sons and daughters and their companions. Tonight, I shall make an important announcement regarding my inheritance and the succession that you all seem so keen on. But first... I must tell you how incredibly disappointed I am. After all, until this very day, no one has been able to solve the riddle of the epitaph. Even though Kinzo said he was disappointed, a condescending smile rose to his face as though there was no way the likes of these could have solved it, and his gaze passed through all of them. I had planned to hand over everything to the one who could solve it, but none have been able to solve it before today. And here we stand, with nothing of mine passed down to anyone. How shameful to think that not one among you has come forward with the qualifications to succeed me. How truly disappointing and shameful and pathetic. <laughs> the siblings hung their heads in silence. Of course, they would have solved it if they could. True, they couldn't deny that they wasted a golden opportunity, but... It was just so hard. Therefore, I am proclaiming here and now that I will suspend the use of the epitaph's riddle as a method of choosing my successor. In short, time's up. This is game over. And what a shame for you all. Even though it should have given you all an equal and fair chance, that's gone now. <laughs> It truly sounded like Kinzo was making a victory proclamation. In that case, will my oldest son Kraus succeed the headship? <laughs> the answer is no. What? Thank you for the save reminder vape, I will save. It's Kinzo, y'all, in the flesh. His shoes are so cool. <laughs> in case it's actually game over. Yeah, thank you. We'll see how true that is. He's very fashionable and his voice is very hard to do. I'm, I'm gonna be, like my voice is gonna be gone tomorrow, but that's, you know, worth it. He is thunder, damn. Powerful statement. You understand, right, Kraus? I certainly gave you the title of successor, but all you did was let it go to your head. Do you know what a successor is? It means the person who will inherit your position after you, father. Wrong. The position of successor isn't something that's guaranteed by the current head at all. 
Listen up, Kraus. I won't tell you this again. A successor is what you call someone who finds everyone else who's after the headship, thoroughly breaks their noses and makes it so they can never disobey him again. This is not only something that can be said of the headship. It's the same with money. A rich person doesn't mean someone who has money. It means someone who crushes everyone who had more money than himself and who scrabbles together more money than anyone else. It's the same with talent. A genius is not what you call a person blessed with talent. It means a person who crushes everyone with more talent than themselves. A person who can coerce geniuses and all other people to call them that using strength and charisma. You have a mistaken impression when it comes to all of these things. So you aren't of the right caliber to be my successor. <laughs> uh, I'll take your words to heart. Perhaps that truly was Kinzo's philosophy. As a result of faithfully carrying out that rant-like philosophy of his, Kinzo had glorified the Ushinomi family to the state it was in today. It may be hard to imagine after his immersion in the occult in recent years, but that brutally overbearing outlook was no more or less than Ushiromi Kinzo's charisma and aura. Such an unsatisfactory factory person is not qualified to inherit everything of the Ushiromiya family. In that case, is Ava, Rudolph, or Rosa qualified? Again, no. You are unable to solve the riddle, and you are also unable to use a scheme to drag Kraus down. All the three of you have managed to do was gather together in a united front to try and extort money from Kraus. And even that scheme was thoughtless. You can't even corner Kraus all by himself. There could be nothing more shameful. You lack the avarice to steal away the position of successor by any means. In order to get what you want, you should sacrifice everything, become as covetous and greedy as possible. The goddess of luck smiles upon the greedy. You three, who don't have that wild spirit, are as unfit for the succession as Kraus is. Even the rest had no words to respond with and they couldn't calculate what it was Kinzo was about to say. Was Kinzo actually planning to proclaim that no one would succeed the headship? If so, that would work to Ava, Rosa, and Rudolph's advantage. After all, in the end, they just have to re renegotiate everything among the siblings after Kinzo's death, splitting the inheritance evenly. It would surely be more troublesome if a specific person's name was raised and proclaimed to be the successor. But would Kinzo really say something to benefit any of the four siblings after demeaning them so much? You don't think he's going to say that because no one will succeed him. He'll donate all of his fortune to charity or something, right? I'm afraid I wouldn't put it past father. The blood has risen to his head. We can't do anything but let him talk for now. Well then, father. What thoughts do you have regarding the succession of the headship? <laughs> Since I am so utterly disappointed in all of you, I've lost the, the desire to hand it over to anyone. And therefore, the Ushiremiya family will end here. It ends with my generation. Th that cannot. The Ushiremiya family was crushed long ago in that earthquake. The current Ishiromiya family is nothing but an illusion of gold I'm glimpsing for an instant. The likes of which will end when I awaken from my slumber. <laughs> Everything in this world is a dream, an illusion. Life is but a daydream before the awakening called death. Ah, yes, that's how it was from the beginning. That I should lose everything when I die was part of Beatrice's contract and her curse. <laughs> As if I'd let you, Beatrice. I will be the one who captures you. Tonight, that goal will be realized. <laughs> For a while, Kinze was overcome with cackling, and his eyes bulged. Whenever he talked about Beatrice, it was always both eloquent and insane. Foolish children such as yourselves truly are daydreams. It's as though you were never there from the beginning. Disappear. Wake up. Disappear from the doze of the truth that I am. You, 
You failures that have not built up anything that makes you worthy to succeed me. Kinzo-san, if I may. What is it, my friend? Nanja nervously raised his hand, asking to speak. Kinzo allowed him to. I understand how you feel, Kinzo-san. Because you love your children, you expect a lot of them. And as a parent and grandparent myself, I understand how parental affection can make you feel as though your expectations were betrayed. However, you are extraordinary, Kinzo-san. A genius. Isn't saying that it's only natural for them to catch up to you a little too harsh? Despite that, Krauss-san, Eva-san, Rudolf-san, Rosa-san, and all of their partners have done their very best to catch up with you. Oh, and just how much money have they built up with this doing their best? After these cowards fail completely in ventures and gain debt, and still try to sponge off me, how can you say that they did their very best? Money is the crystallization of everything in this world. If you cannot grasp that, then you cannot grasp the world. If a life cannot strongly grasp this world, it doesn't deserve to live. Disappear. Disappear from my life and reality. That's a reckless argument. With that logic, even I must not live. Even so, I believe the time I spent playing chess with you was worthwhile for both of us, Kinzo-san. You should know better than anyone else that there are many things in this world that cannot be bought with money. <laughs> As the siblings motionlessly hung their heads, they cheered Nanjo on inside their hearts. Not one of the siblings could offer their opinion in front of Kinzo in a rage, but Kinzo's close friend Nanjo alone was allowed to. Even though Kinzo had raged so fiercely, after being admonished by Nanjo, he nodded several times, as though in agreement. The surprisingly obedient side of him might have seemed cute, but there was no one here who could laugh. It may be true that your children haven't built up as great a fortune as you have, Kinzo-san. Though, even so, they're rich enough to make me jealous. But besides money, they have also built up many things that cannot be bought with money. When it comes to that, they are in no way inferior to you, Kinzo-san. Hmm. Huh. And what do you claim they have built up that cannot be bought with money? Happiness. Family. They have found wonderful partners, had children, and each has built up their own happy homes. They have glorified your family name and have brought back grandchildren. Grandchildren are wonderful. We older people can look at these young grandchildren who will live on into a new era that we will not even be given a chance to see, and in them, we can imagine an endless future. Isn't that the sole entertainment we have in our old age? Remember, Kinzo-san. Remember your joy when they first brought back their grandchildren. Your children and your grandchildren will carry your great works on to future generations, setting an example. That is something that an individual cannot accomplish, no matter how much money they have. The siblings all nodded in agreement. Certainly, Kinzo had looked happy when his grandchildren had just been born. Back when he still had some sanity in his heart. However, did Kinzo's heart still contain a human's warmth? In other words, in exchange for the vast riches I created, instead of gaining money, I have gained my grandchildren? N no, that's not what I... So, in exchange for the several tons, tens of billions in wealth that I have built up, I have gained a single grandchild from each of my children. <laughs> and this is wonderful. So I have created a single life using 10 billion yen. That's how it is. Interesting. Truly an interesting example in the alchemical sense, right? <laughs> what valuable grandchildren. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> is that right, Kraus? Is your daughter worth 10 billion yen? Krauss couldn't answer instantly. It wasn't that he didn't have confidence in his daughter. It was because he didn't have a clue what Kinzo was trying to test him with in this question. But when Natsuhi was then pressed for an answer, she responded, 
breaking Krause's silence with an answer of her own interpretation. Y yes, Jessica's a daughter that I wouldn't let go of for even, even for 10 billion yen. In that sense, I believe she has a value that can't be measured with money. Oh, so you can state for certain that she's worth 10 billion. <laughs> what about you, Eva? What about your George? Since Natsuki had answered that way, Eva naturally came up with her own answer as well. Even though Eva should have known better than to respond to a provoca provocative question like this, she answered as well. Yes, father. George is worth 10 billion. No, even more than that. And that's not in the abstract sense of things money can't buy. George will certainly build up a fortune equal to his worth. He'll become a grandson worthy of carrying on your great works, father. Ava sent a glance at Hideyoshi and Natsuhi as if she'd scored a point. When she heard what Ava had said, Natsuhi was about to add more praise for her daughter, but stopped at a glare from Kraus. Hmm, I see. Then what about you, Rudolph? What about your battler? Compared to George Kuhn, there's nothing about battler I can brag about. If he was kidnapped and we were threatened with a ransom of 10 billion, I'd feel like sticking a bow on the guy and letting them have him. <laughs> on top of that, he's an idiot and reckless. He talks about grand dreams and things that couldn't be done. I guess in that way, he's a super idiot worth the equivalent of 10 billion normal idiots. But I'm sure that guy could do things that even a group of 10 billion average people couldn't do. Well, I'm pretty sure I'll fall flat on this face. The world isn't easy. But at the very least, there's no doubt that watching over his life will be more fun than looking at 10 billion average people. Ava clicked her tongue at that clever style of speech, which would probably match Kinzo's tastes. Apparently, Rudolph had done that on purpose, so he grinned back at her. What of Maria? Maria is my adorable and only daughter. Her value cannot be measured with money. That is all. Hmm. <laughs> I see. Dreams in the future, miracles and possibilities are the source of my magical power. No magic without hopes holds any strength. <laughs> I cannot expect any more from you who have proven to be average, but I see. My grandchildren hold poss future possibilities, and expecting a magical miracle from them may be worthwhile. If you're saying that in this way, they are more worth more than 10 billion? Hmm. Yes. I could see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. When Kinza got in a rage, he wouldn't let anyone speak up. But even so, he would sometimes accept something on his own while yelling by himself, and change his own opinion. That's what this felt like to the siblings. Apparently, even though Kinzo had been disgusted by his unsuccessful children and had cast them away as being unfit for the inheritance of his title or his fortune, he wasn't sure about his grandchildren. At this rate, he might soon say that the inheritance would go to his grandchildren, instead of the siblings. As the siblings sat in fear of what their fickle and short-tempered father might suddenly think of next, they carefully watched his every move. Hmm. Let me change my thinking a little. I have absolutely no desire to hand over all I have to any of you. However, it will be quite interesting to question the grandchildren to see if one of them is qualified. I've always thought of them as mere kids, but there's a chance I'll find a shining gem amongst them that will catch me off guard. And testing them for that would be... Yes, it would be a shame to abandon that final side trip in my remaining life. Hmm. Well then, what shall I do? I can, with confidence, recommend George as someone fitting to follow after you. Ava claimed that right away. Not so he looked like she was about to follow along, but Kraus gave her a look telling her to restrain herself. So she, she swallowed her words. <laughs> How bold. Then let us do this. Or do this. I will individually question the grandchildren to see if they are qualified to succeed the Ushirami family inheritance and will. 
father. However, that does not mean that one of you will indirectly receive the inheritance. I am already disappointed in you all. There is no longer anything I have to give you. Not a thing. The ones I will question are my grandchildren. And the ones who might succeed me are my grandchildren. Make absolutely sure you do not mistake this, understood? I shall obey father's decision. Same here. I'll go along with what he decides. What about you, Anaki? Uh, of course. I believe father will make a wise judgment. I will also obey father's decision. I shall think of how to test my grandchildren. Which means this is no longer any business of yours. After all, none of you are involved with the succession in any way now. So right here, right now, perhaps we should discuss a different matter that does involve you. A different matter? Indeed. That is tonight's true purpose, and the true purpose for this final Ushirami family conference as well. <laughs> I have no desire to hear your thoughts and opinions. I demand only your assistance. Assistance in my ceremony. Your ceremony? Quiet. Father's talking now. Rudolph and the rest had automatically narrowed their brows at this, the occult-like word. Could he be planning to start some strange ceremony involving Beatrice's resurre resurrection again? And he wanted their assistance? What in the world was he planning to do? In the past, he had carried out many eccentricities that he called by the same name, such as starting to burn a strange incense and filling the whole mansion with a stench. To the siblings, a ceremony was nothing more than one of the aged Kinzo's obnoxious hobbies. Father, just what do you mean by that? If we can assist you, we'll do anything. Right, Rosa? Uh, yes. But what in the world is it? A ceremony is inscribed in my epitaph. A ceremony to revive Beatrice and open the door to the Golden Land. That witch who escaped her cage of flesh and sneeringly slipped through my fingers I shall now capture. And force into submission with my greatest hidden art. For that purpose, I must offer 13 people as sacrifices. <laughs> Gathering 13 people's worth of sacrifices is no easy feat. But tonight is the family conference. Many adults have gathered on the Okanjima. There could be no other day on which to carry out the ceremony. Taken literally, it sounded like he was telling them to become human sacrifices for his dark ceremony and die. <laughs> Ridiculous. Was this some kind of metaphor? But they didn't even have a clue what he was trying to illustrate. The siblings whispered together about what Kinza was saying. What's dad going on about? Is this his usual sickness? Probably. Listen silently for now. I I'm sorry, father. I don't understand what you mean by that. What is it you don't understand? I am making this extremely simple. I told you that I'll choose 13 of the humans on this island and offer them as sacrifices in a ceremony to revive Beatrice. Even worthless people like you can be very useful as sacrifices in my ceremony. <laughs> Listen, this is not a joke, nor anything of the sort. This is my final bit, my final ceremony. The last one I will desire in my life. There are now more than 13 humans on this island. In short, that's a headcount that can easily satisfy the massive number of sacrifices I require. Become the sacrifices for my ceremony. Kinzo-san, you weren't serious about what you said back then, were you? It wasn't a joke. Unusually for him, Nanjo's face changed color as he sh stood up and shouted. It seemed that this wasn't the first time Nanjo had heard all this dark talk about 13 sacrifices. Sorry, my friend. 
That was no joke, nor anything of the sort. It is what I bet my life on. The final ceremony. The final game that I will attempt. Yes, this is a game. If gaining my fortune and leaving the island is your goal, then there are only two ways to achieve it. Will you escape being chosen as one of the 13 sacrifices and spectacularly survive by finally solving the riddle of the epitaph and stopping the ceremony? Or will you kill me and thereby stop this ceremony? Those are your only two options. By now, everyone wasn't just whispering but chattering and muttering away. Even the siblings had noticed that Kinza was beginning to act abnormally. Father, are you a little tired? Genji-san, has father been drinking? No. The master is sensible. T Sorry, Dad. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Dad's free to start up any weird ceremony he wants to revive the witch he loves. That's his hobby. But getting wrapped up in that... <laughs> Being made into a human sacrifice is a little more than I can handle. Rudolph, are you trying to interrupt Father? What are you talking about, Aniki? You expect me to listen to something that's that shady and say, Oh, really? Was the ceremony Kinzo had mentioned literally something disturbing? Or was it some kind of test to chew the successor? It seemed that Rudolph had taken it literally. But Ava apparently still believed that it was something like a test or examination to find a proper successor. Ava, what? <laughs> but Kinzo responded with a clear smile. Well then, that is all I have to say. No objections or opinions are necessary from you. I will simply awaken from my dream of having four unsuccessful children. To all of you, what will occur now before your very eyes may seem like a dream. An illusion, something that could conceivably be of this world, and a world that defies understanding. But that is that itself is my reality. Now, I will finally awaken from the shallow, useless dream that all of you are. Come, the game has already begun. See, with this many of you here, I can take the take lives starting with anyone. So long, my unsuccessful children. And for the final and only time in your lives, be useful for my ceremony. Arise, Pendragon's memorial troops. When Kinzo raised his arms high like an opera singer and yelled as though towards a packed audience, the air shattered like glass, and the outlines of three people who supposedly hadn't been invited to this island appeared. Chester 45, right here. Chester 410, right here. Chester 00, right here, sir. Three girls with strange forms suddenly appeared behind Kinzo. Where from? When? Who? Who were they? The humans were thrown off balance, and their minds went blank. Because they spent all that time thinking, they lost their last chance to survive. You have permission to shoot six to death. I leave the choice of targets up to you. Begin your attack. Unrestricted firing understood, sir. Thank you for granting us such excellent targets. Everyone, commence unrestricted firing. <laughs> First, what in? Yeah. <laughs> When 410 scratched the air with her finger, a golden bow appeared in empty space and she, she pulled its string. The golden arrow that had been readied there was fired off without any hesitation, flew around the room leaving haphazard golden curves everywhere, and chose Natsuhi from among those sitting at the table of the family conference, pulverizing the left half of her face. Flesh and deep red blood scattered around, leaving massive red spatter marks on the relatives' faces and the pure white tablecloth. Silence fell. Despite the massive number of deep red spots left on the tablecloth, no one could understand why Natsuhi's head was half smashed, nor why she was hanging her head as though dozing while still sitting, and they watched on in silence. 
Those sitting on Natsuhi's right-hand side were silent for a relatively long time, but those sitting to her left were not. Because the people sitting on that side had been shown how her head had been smashed open like a watermelon or a pomegranate. You could even see inside her. Natsuhi. One down. Natsuhi, is it? A luckless woman to the end. Next. Zero zero, firing. After scratching the empty air in the same way and readying her bow, zero zero fired as well. After it flew around and around at high speeds like the Golden Arrow 410 had released, drawing a convoluted curve in the same manner, it smashed half of Rudolph's head in the same way as he looked at Natsuhi in shock, killing him instantly. This time, everyone managed to avoid freezing up mentally. They realized that a fearsome murder had started playing out right in front of them, just as Kinzo had said. And they realized that Kinzo would probably kill even more. <sighs> Shrill sc screams burst out. Even so, they didn't know what to do. So they could only keep screaming and flapping their wide open mouths like goldfish. Father, what do you think you're doing? Y you fool, run now. As Eva asked Kinzo that in total shock, Hideyoshi, who had come to his senses faster than anyone else and risen to his feet, pulled at her arm from behind. However, merciless fate's choice for the third sacrifice was Hideyoshi. Just like the two before him, half of Hideyoshi's head was neatly smashed, and the right side of his head, which had happened to be facing that direction at the time, had been blown away with its contents exposed like a watermelon or a pomegranate. So, still holding Eva, Hideyoshi slumped backwards and fell down. Still held by her beloved husband, Eva fell over backwards with him. Dear, dear. <laughs> Ava screamed. It was only natural. The face she had been looking for had been half lost, and the crushed skull, the smashed brains, and the crushed jaw all lay there. 45. Impact. It's a hit. Spectacular. Fire again. Three more remain. F Father! Wh wh what, what is this supposed to be? When Kraus stood up forcefully and was about to rush Kinzo, Zero Zero blocked him. With her slender looking body, she held back Kraus with just the palm of her right hand. He still tried to resist and attack Kinzo. So Zero Zero lifted Kraus by the nape of the neck and twisted into his a Adam's apple with her thumb. It seemed to be very painful and Kraus was overcome with agony. Everyone, run! Get the police! An ambulance! Quickly! Everyone, let's escape! Escape! Nudger's sharp words finally dissolved the spell that had been holding them down in the chairs. When Goda and Kamasawa each tried to escape from the dining hall first, 410 moved in an instant and appeared there, blocking the way. <laughs> you sure are slow, Nii. Did you think I'd let you escape, Nii? <laughs> Help me! Goda-san, duck! Even though Goda didn't understand, he crouched when he heard Kiria's, Kiria's sharp voice. Then, a burst of air rushed above his head. Kiria had taken a big swing with a chair to mow 410 down. Hell yeah. But 410, still with a mocking expression, easily caught that widely swung chair with a single hand. What a scary woman, Nia. You really want to go the same way as your husband that much? From the cuff of her arm, where she had caught the chair, something like a shining golden snake appeared, wrapped itself around the chair, and burst open. It was a fearsome power, like a vice. When Kitty realized that being in front of her, which looked like a girl, 
was actually something that surpassed human knowledge and that a human could not even begin to oppose. Her head was filled with a fierce alarm bell that welled up from deep inside her. Genji, Shannon, and Kanon, all the servants permitted to wear the one-winged eagle, continued to stand calmly at attention by the wall, even with a scene like this before their eyes, making them look very bizarre and eerie. For an instant, Kiri had thought that they'd managed to stay calm because they were with the enemy, and had been given a guarantee that they wouldn't be killed. But as soon as she thought that, the side of Genji's face was blown away before her eyes. Genji-san. 45, impact. It's hit. <laughs> Genji, how unfortunate. Rest in peace, my friend. <laughs> Your death will not be wasted. You will become one of the 13 keys essential to the resurrection of my beloved witch. <laughs> the half of Genji's expression that remained was as indifferent as ever. He tilted, fell over, and sent a blood-red splatter out across the floor. Genji Sama. We're nothing more than the witch's pieces. Nothing more. Nothing more. From the meek and frustrated, no. Resigned expressions on Shannon and Common's faces. One couldn't sense any naive hopes that they'd be rescued. That's right. Kinzo was, in the truest sense, carrying out these murders at random. In the truest sense, he was killing like it was a game to see who would be saved and who would be killed. Well then, who we go for next, Ian? Hehe. <laughs> 410 looked at Kitty for a second. In that second, Kitty was prepared for her own death. But when she readied her golden bow in midair, 410 was looking at someone else over Kitty's shoulder. So, as imprudent as it was, Kitty felt as though she had been saved. Again, an ugly, exploding, popping sound rang throughout the room. Who was it this time? When Kitty had turned to face the direction of the sound, she saw blood gushing like a fountain, and Ava lying on her husband's chest. Of course, her face had been half smashed, just like her husband's. 410 had mercilessly targeted Ava as she'd clung to her husband's corpse, sobbing. Let go of Nissan! Let go of Nissan! Just stop it, father! Just stop this brutality! Run away, Rosa! <laughs> Rosa's objection didn't reach Kinzo as he continued to laugh loudly in the blood-splattered dining hall, and she wasn't able to lessen Krause's pain at being lifted up by the nape of the neck by Zero Zero. So Rosa had no choice but to use force. She lifted up a chair beside her and gave a warning. Father, order her to let go of Nissan. Just stop them from doing this. I cannot. If that is what you desire, then prevent it using your own power. Cut a path through your own through to your own fate with your own hands. You who have always hid behind the backs of others in fear, let me see you overcome your weakness one last time in your life. <laughs> Father. Ah. The chair that Rosa had lifted up swung down at the father who had reigned as a symbol of terror for her entire life. It was the greatest and final act of bravery and self-control in Rosa's life. What Kinzo had said might have been true. If she had grasped that courage much sooner, her life might have become more free, unrestrained by anyone else. Then there was a bursting sound. The sound of Rosa's chair fiercely hitting Kinzo could not have been this. With the chair still lifted up, she neatly lost half of her head and slumped over. Still holding Krause up with one hand, Zero Zero had stuck her other hand out towards Rosa. The golden snake released from that arm had constricted Rosa in a helix. 
and it smashed into her head. Defensive firing. I apologize for the discourtesy of shooting so close to you, sir. I care not. Hmm. So this makes six people. Yes, Lord Go Goldsmith. This makes six people. When she indifferently communicated that, Zero Zero let go of Krauss, whom she had been lifting up this whole time. Indeed. So, the sacrifices of the first Twilight were Eva, Rudo, Rosa, Natsuhi, Hideyoshi, and Genji. <laughs> Quick break. Wow, that was intense. I... Yeah. I love this game a lot. Yeah, the, the Steam visuals, or the, the PS3 ones, compared to the original game ones, they're quite different, and I think in a lot of ways it's sort of improved. But I, I think I mentioned this last week, my, I have a soft spot for the original art. Yeah, I, I think Rudolph looks more like broad and buff. He looks less like, hmm, let me think. Yeah, he looks more like a rough dude, you know, like, and he, he kind of, talks like that as well, like, he, he's kind of like a relaxed sort of badass type, it, and you kind of get the idea that's a front he puts up even, and here he just looks like a neat, just like a neat, well put together guy. <laughs> yeah. He looks uh, very different. It's different, so it's bad. No, it's not true. Um, but they, they, they tone him down a little bit, almost. Um, whoops. It's, yeah. I, I like the original one better, too. Hmm. Who else? Most of the others are very similar, actually. Like, for the most part, they did a really good job capturing the same sort of spirit. Um, Kinzo is a good point, actually. He, he looks... A lot more ragged, kinda, in uh, in the original game. Again, he's too neat here. When he's he's a really old man, who is basically bonkers. He's completely given up on like life, I guess is the best way to describe that. And and you don't really like he looks really like clean and put together, and that doesn't quite fit. But you know, it's, it, it's overall though, it, it's, it's a very good art. I like it a lot. You expect the smell of his room to accompany him, yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good way of putting that. Gosh. What a scene though, holy shit. Um, I remember the first time I read this, and I wasn't really... This scene is kind of what made me really start thinking and trying to solve the game. Which I know is kind of wild, like four episodes in, right? Um, but I'm very used to, you know, Agatha Christie and that kind of stuff where it's... You know, you start a book, by the end of the book, you find out who did it, you can theorize along the way, and that's it. There's no overarching plot, so I kind of figured I was mostly focused on solving the murders for each uh, arc. And this is kind of where I kind of got the message that some of these events span across all of them. Some of the events don't. There's some rules here. 
and you need to figure out what applies and what doesn't. And one of those things is, uh, is Kinzo alive or dead? And yeah, when they started discussing if he's dead or alive in, in that one scene, I, I was like, oh yeah, shit, good point. I think he's dead. And then next scene that has the family at the conference in it, there he is, he just walks in. Actually, he walks in like with Kraus and stuff when they go see him. So that was immediately weird. And then here, he just shows up and starts rambling. And then this happens. My mind was blown. Still kind of is. It's a... Uh... Yeah, it turns everything around. And... It's, it has such an impact that, yeah, that's why I was so hyped for the scene. I was like smiling through parts of it and trying not to. Because <laughs> then my voice comes out like I'm smiling and that doesn't fit, you know, but. Yeah, you feel like your theories are completely wrong. I, I, I don't think. I'm sure you have, like... What am I trying to say? So, if you have a bunch of theories, it, even if it, it seems like this kind of throws all of it on its head and makes it all wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean that your theories are wrong. Kinzo Kin gave some hints to that. I won't explain further because that would be a spoiler. <laughs> Um, but also, usually, like, parts of your theories are still, they can still apply, it's such a detailed and intricate story overall that you're probably more correct than you would expect or think. Basically. Yeah. So don't give up. Don't stop thinking, as I believe Anja said at some point. And then we're gonna all find out together what actually happened. Um, gosh. Ha! Ah. I hate Kinzo, but I also kind of love him because he's just, he's so much fun. But wow, is he terrible. Wow, is he just, just the worst. Hmm. That's something that um, Imaneko is really good at, and also like a huge pitfall if you're trying to actually solve the mystery, right? Is the story leads your thinking? Um, and that's very much on purpose, but it does it super well. Um, when you actually read it the second time, there are so many hints, but you don't because you don't have the context for them. You don't pick up on it unless you really start like looking for it. Which I was never really, like, I was never with it enough to do that until very late in the series, but uh, a lot of, a bunch of people actually did ping, like, they, they did figure things out really early on. Very impressive. Like, there are, there are hints, like, in the first two chapters, <laughs> the big ones. It's, uh, impressive. Hmm. I guess they're not huge ones, but still. You know. Oof. Just a changing house it real quick. There, there are a lot of interlinked parts, and, um, finding out what is actually true and what isn't is, is a challenge for sure. Um, I can't finish that sentence because it would be a spoiler. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, I, I gave him an eye patch, and um, uh, put the, put the eagle on there, Wh which is very, what's the word, self-indulgent, there we go, yeah. But I figure why not, my stream, my rules. Um... 
things I think to do. <laughs> yeah. It's also a very like Beatrice fan to do thing to do, and that's more my my reasoning. <laughs> Um, also, as for Natsuhi, I personally, personally, I sympathize with her a lot, um, but there's some stuff coming up that, um, like, I liked her fine the first four episodes. She gets some spotlight moments-ish later on that might make you warm up to her a little bit. Um, same for Beatrice, actually. But maybe not. It could make you, like, hate them both. I don't know. I can't say, because spoilers. <laughs> um... I, I understand the, the conflict with Beatrice, because, like... Yeah, she suffered a lot, and she did some terrible things. But, you know, we're not we're not done with her story yet. There's a lot more to uncover there. And it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Oh boy. I I was so hyped for this whole bit. And it was as good as I remember it being. Very satisfying. Not not that I like like that everyone got murdered, but you know. It's just such a wild um, twist of events. And such a tense scene, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been... Yes, it, it really is the culmination of, of everything up until then. And if, if there's one thing that the authors are really good at, it's, it's writing tense scenes. And then not, like, not drawing it out too long to the point where it you don't feel like it's tense anymore, because I feel like there are authors that care, like, they keep the tension too high for too long. And it desensitizes you a bit, but here it's like, whew, you know, it's like a kind of a relief when it's over almost. And then you just get real sad. Yeah, it is out of nowhere, and remember that, like, I almost forgot, actually, because it's been a week. But this comes right after all of the Anjan Maria scenes. And then this happens. Totally catches you off guard. It, it's, it, it's... It's genius. It really... It really is. And I, I don't say that lightly. I really believe that just... The, the, the writer's just really a genius. I am also going to save real quick. Well, there's our girl. Um, I haven't been showing like the tips and stuff and the, the character summaries. Because, you know, just, just buy the game. Just buy the game. And then you can read all of it. Um... What I didn't consider that you might be missing out on hints. Um, oops, sorry about the... Buy the game. Problem solved. Um, although I was like... You know, it's not necessarily accessible to everyone, but it goes on sale regularly. Um, both of the, the, the question arcs and the answer arcs. So just, you know, consider it. This is going to be, like, a really quick break, and then I went on a huge ramble. Um, so I'm going to take this as my proper break. I hope the uh, wind noise in the background hasn't been too annoying. Sorry about that. Should have popped on some music, maybe. But, um, yeah. Oh, you can barely hear it. Has the game been this? Has the game been too quiet, or is it like normal? Because I can do some adjustments, but 
it should be okay. I did so many tests. Okay. As long as it's good, then we're good. Um, if that changes... Yes, thank you. Please complain if it's not good, because then I can adjust it and then... You know. You can actually uh, hear what's going on and have it not be loud. Which is the ideal. Um... Just checking my throat. <laughs> oh no, I... yeah. Don't worry, um... We are... I say this a lot, but... Don't worry about typos. We all make them, it's fine. Typing is hard, English is hard. Don't even worry about it. Um... Yes, I am good to go. <laughs> Same. It's, I, I try to, I'm trying to unlearn always correcting myself and stuff. It's, you know, it's a work in progress. But then aren't most people. Okay. It was a massacre that happened in an instant. The interior of the dining hall had been dirtied by blood splatter and the six unlucky victims lay with their heads brutally exposed. In a way that was fitting for that abnormal space, Kinzo's abnormal laugh alone echoed out. <laughs> the curtain has finally risen. The ceremony to revive Beatrice has begun. You lucky ones who have managed to escape the first twilight, Allow me to introduce you to my friends. Arise, my friend. Ronove. <gasps> it's our boy. It's my boy. When Kinzo called Ronove's name, the demon butler showed himself in midair, bowing respectfully. Pleased to meet you, everyone. And good day to those of you I haven't seen for a long time. <laughs> it seems this place is once again spectacularly untidy. Pay it no mind. It takes a stimulant of this level to wake me from my day daydream-like days. Allow me to introduce my friend, a reliable butler and one of the 72 great demons, Rove. I am pleased to make your acquaintance. Just who was he making that introduction to? Kraus and Kiri were still down on their backsides, and Nanjo, Goda, and Kamasawa could only look up at this middle-aged gentleman that didn't know in shock. They didn't know in shock. Only Shannon and Kanon seemed to recognize him, and they bowed deeply. So, I wasn't able to greet Genji. I hope he was at least able to fulfill his purpose pain painlessly. It, it was an instant death from a direct hit to the head. He didn't have the time to feel the pain. Is that so? Very well. Allow me to introduce another friend. Arise, my friend, Virgilio. Once again, the silhouette of someone the relatives didn't know appeared from an empty space. She appeared in a refined dress while making an elegant greeting. Thank you for summoning me, Master. Although I would rather not have been summoned into a bloody place such as this. Allow me to introduce her too. This is both my friend and a reliable counselor, Virgilia. I desire to borrow your great power as the Witch of the Finite. Lend it to me. Even if I tried to refuse, such a thing would be permitted for one subordinated by the power of your summonings. As you wish, Master. Still, what a fearsome fellow. To think he summoned three of the Chester Sisters' corps, and then me, and even Virgilia. Even though it's only in the area of summoning, to think that he surpasses Milady so thoroughly. 
How frightening. I can't help but shudder at the Ishirimiya blood. In order to carry out Beatrice's resurrection ceremony, I shall give it my all as a summoner. This still isn't enough. In order to perfectly succeed in the ceremony this time, I shall summon more. The Pendragon Memorial Troops, and Ronove, and Vigilia. I can still call more. With my magical power, I can still call many more. Answer to my summons. One of the 72 demons, Gap. Gap? You can even materialize her? It probably means that the corrosion has advanced even more on this island. It has already proceeded far enough to materialize us. By now, we shouldn't be surprised no matter how great a demon he summons. Has Rokunjima already been completely sucked into a parallel world then? I hope he does not surrender. He learned a lot last time, correct? After all this time, he won't surrender over this much. Probably, I should say. <laughs> well then, shall we enjoy the stage we now stand upon? It seems the main character is the master this time. Let us expect a script of a different flavor than the ladies. When Kinza strongly concentrated his magical power, a pale light gathered in the empty air, twisted, and a magic circle was drawn there with a deep red glow. I hadn't seen the sprite yet. And with a sound like glass breaking, a new demon could be seen there. You did well to answer to my call. Gap, one of the 72 great demons. I should have thought of a voice beforehand. This is one of hell of a place you've summoned me to. Did you call me to clean up this blood-stained room, Goldsmith? The literally devilish woman, wrapped in a venomous, ominous costume, looked at the scene which should have been made to cover her eyes, which should have made her cover her eyes, and twisted her mouth in a grin. To summon you for such a reason would be like using a cashmere muffler to mop the floor. It's been a long time, Gap. To think that a great demon such as yourself finally has finally appeared on this island. Perhaps this island is finally submerging completely into fantasy. This all-star cast is even more surprising than the gruesome state of the room. A full three Chester sisters, the great demon Aronovi, the great witch Virgilia, and even me. What's going on? Is this pandemonium? Are you trying to start a concert from hell or something? I see. As a conductor for that, I couldn't think of anyone better than you, Goldsmith. I will have your assistance as facilitator in the completion of my ceremony to res resurrect Beatrice. You have no objections to my summoning contract, correct? Of course not. There's no way I could resist the subordinating power of the legendary great summoner, Lord Goldsmith who forced the great witch Beatrice to do his bidding. I'll assist you. Although I will of course ask a fitting price. So, what's my first job? Capture the cowards who made it through the first twilight. Fortunately, there are still seven here, aren't there? Nanjo, Shannon, Kano, Goda, Kumasawa, Kirie, and Kraus. <laughs> If these seven are all offered as sacrifices, that's exactly 13 people. Until it's time for the second and later toilets to be carried out, throw them into the cage of sacrifices. <laughs> the cashmere mop, huh? Understood. As Gap shrugged her shoulders, she looked at Kraus, who was still down on his butt. She glared. Then, when she snapped her fingers, Kraus was swallowed up by the floor as though a round pit ball had opened up beneath him. <laughs> One down. There was no hole in the floor. But it, it had certainly looked as though Krause had been swallowed up by a hole and disappeared. 
<laughs> Searching for her next prey. Gap's gray gaze crossed Kitty's. She snapped her fingers. Kitty had jumped back as though repelled. Her instincts had been right. After all, in the place where she'd been until a second ago, a round, jet black hole had appeared. The same kind that had swallowed up Kraus. However, before she could catch her balance, another pit ball appeared and swallowed her up. Even Kitty had no way of eluding Gap's capture. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That was actually funny, I'm sorry. <laughs> he just went like, mm. <laughs> Okay. <sighs> when she snapped her fingers again, a shocked Nanjo was swallowed up by the floor and disappeared. When she did it again, 410 let out a short yell and jumped back. This time, a slightly larger pitfall had opened, swallowing both Shannon and Kamu who had been standing in a line by the door. But because 410 had jumped away from the door, the way was no longer blocked. Instinctively aware that he would be next, Gota dashed out through that door. Of course, Kamasawa also escaped with lightning speed, chasing after Gota. As Gap snapped her fingers over and over, round, Jet black pitfalls opened one after another behind them, chasing them. However, they did nothing but drive the recklessly fleeing pair away and couldn't swallow them up. Gota and Kamasawa had escaped in a matter of seconds. I've gotten slow. I'll let two get away. Don't worry, we are currently locking onto the SKP targets. Data link ready. <laughs> Shall we snipe? No, I cannot authorize that. They are precious sacrifices. Wait for the master's authorization. Great Lord Goldsmith, we await your orders. It is still too soon for the coming of the second twilight, is what the source of my magical power is whispering to me. It must not be now. Let them do as they please. It isn't as though they can escape from this island. The source of the master's magical power is noise and risk and tests of luck. <laughs> In other words, it means being fickle, it would seem. <laughs> Perhaps you could also put it that way. Good work, Gap. Let us stealthily advance the ceremony from here on. Well then, that is that. Next are my grandchildren. I will test them to see whether they are qualified to become my successor. Let's see, how shall I test their qualifications? <laughs> if you decide that they're qualified, do you intend to do you intend to abandon Beato's resurrection? Of course, and despite that, I will test them. <laughs> Perhaps a woman cannot understand that contradiction, nor my madness. <laughs> well, apparently, men are as weird as ever. I don't get the very concept of playing around with risk. Oh my. And I thought you loved that sort of thing. Of course! If a man whispers to me about dangerous risks and love, I go head over heels. But only if he's hot. But only if he's hot, scare cord. Cap, I love you. <laughs> Be quiet. Try to refrain from whispering. <laughs> Truly noisy women. But at least they aren't boring. This is what makes summoning so pleasant. All of you will bear one side of the scales of noise and risk in my ceremony. This, that is the work I expect of you. Six brutally murdered corpses lay in the dining hall, and it was contaminated with red, gruesome decorations. It was now unimaginable that, until just a second ago, 13 humans had been arranged here in a well-organized manner. Kinzo lined up the famous demons and their subordinates, 
loudly declared the beginning of a night of overwhelming mass murders, and swore to himself that he would certainly revive Beatrice and open the door to the Golden Land. I'm fanboying very hard this episode. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting. Now the curtain finally rises on the first twilight. <laughs> that Kinzo, I see he loves being flashy as usual. So, even that man who can be more persistent than anything when he follows you around, can shine so when on the stage. Damn, always killing in a grotesque way as usual. Smashing half of their heads. The bad taste your witches and demons of all have always pisses me off. Smashing half of their heads. I see. So she's realized that in the games up until now, that's been the most ideal method of killing. Ideal? How is such a grotesque way of killing ideal? Isn't it though? Try and remember the very first game. You. So. You're that new demon or whatever that just appeared. Damn, so does this mean that the witch's corrosion continued and that there are now even more creeps wandering around? The more the witch's corrosion advances, the more Rokanjima tilts towards the spirit world. That's why strange, insane people keep appearing one by one. This island has been closed off by the typhoon, so no human can leave it, much less appear as a new character to increase their numbers. But the more the corrosion advances, the more witches and demons can appear, without limit, increasing one by one. By now, there might be more demons than humans among the characters appearing in this insane tale. Their numbers might be the thing that represents this mad corrosion. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. And the corrosion hasn't just affected the number of people, but apparently their fashion sense as well. If the corrosion advances any further and even more weird people appear, what, just what in the world will they be wearing? It's so crazy, I can't imagine. <sighs> Seriously, give me a break. Don't make these weird guys increasing number anymore. <laughs> I can't do that. They'll keep increasing more and more. I'll defile the foolish closed circle rule hum humans speak of over and over again. Welcome to my elegant game, Gap. It's been a long time, Liche. Have you been well? Why do I ask? You look great. Have you gotten younger? You look two or three hundred years younger than when I last saw you. Ah, I see. The demon grandfather had summoned and introduced as Gap. Took a glance at me and then grinned as though she'd figured out something out on her own. That smile felt openly obscene. I guess she's Beato's friend. Which means she's gotta be a creep among creeps. By the way, they're saying something about a closed circle or whatever, but what does that mean? Serial mur murder mystery novels that occur in places isolated from the outside world, like Rokojima is now, are sometimes called closed circles since such a place is isolated from the outside. It's like a circle that's closed. Therefore, in general, the characters and suspects are limited in number. Having new, suspe su having new suspect candidates added on one after another from outside the circle goes against the etiquette of mystery novels. In other words, the witch is probably trying to desecrate humans and the mystery genre itself. Hmm, you're Gretel? I see, you look like a wise kid. <laughs> I love kids like you. You taste so sweet and tantalizing. Gross. Keep the jokes to your clothing. It's devilish pretty's newest Jack the Ripper Christmas blood. Sorry for having a style that a country bumpkin from the human world couldn't understand, okay? At least we know it's well ventilated. Why don't you add a gap to the head part as well? Let a little air into your brain. 
Gap is always sensitive to the fashions of the spirit world. But this year's fad truly is bold. I think I'll order one sometime. For you, Li Chen, I'd recommend Alley Gray. Alice in the Graveyard. Let's go to 666 sometime soon to look at the clothes. You really should drop by the spirit world every now and then. When this game is over, I'll be sure to do that. <laughs> Still, your two opponents are pretty cute at each other. It looks like this kid has figured out the meaning of the corpses with their heads half smashed. Know what that is, girl? Just now, she told me to remember the first game. What did that mean? Just what it sounds like. Remember the first twilight of the very first game. When the adults' corpses were found in the garden shed with the magic circle drawn on it. Remember? Episode 1. The First Twilight. Kraus, Rudolph, Kitty, Rosa, Shannon, and Goda. All six of them had their heads pulverized and died. At that time, there were two types of corpses. Some had their faces pulverized, and some had half of their faces pulverized. And that's right. The ones with their faces smashed were Rudolph, Kitty, Rosa, and Goda. The ones with the sides of their heads smashed were Kraus and Shannon. At the time, I thickly created two types of corpses, but I realized that the former, more atrocious type was actually disadvantageous for me. Disadvantageous for you? I see. So that's what this is. That's right. The smashed faces might look atrocious, but that made it hard to confirm the identity of each person. For example, at that time, Uncle Kraus and Shannon Chan had their ha heads half smashed. That alone was atrocious enough, but because half of their faces remained, it was easy to confirm their identities. But Dad and the other three were different. Because his face had been completely destroyed, even I, as his son, could only guess by inference that it had to be Dad because of his clothes and the like. In short, it remained vague until the end whether that really had been Dad's corpse. If this reasoning battle had taken place during the first game as well, I would probably have claimed that, since the identities of Dad and the rest of bodies were impossible to confirm, there was a possibility that one was a fake corpse. After all, Beto didn't state anything in red during that game. Well done, correct. A fake death is one of the basics of the mystery genre. Even if you make a doctor examine the corpse, you can't trust the results if you suspect him of being the corpse's cul the culprit's accomplice. Not the corpse's accomplice. The culprit's accomplice. Therefore, corpses that can't guarantee a death for certain are always disadvantageous for the witch's side. See, I even make typos when I'm talking. Er, er, everyone makes them. You can suspect fake deaths for all corpses, hypothesizing that one or more of them is the culprit for the crimes that follow. It's a move Battle doesn't like, but it's the most elementary move to use against a witch. Yeah, that's right. That's why Beato started using the red. With the red truth, she can carry out a perfect autopsy. <laughs> That's how it is. Normally, for the first twilight, I would use the red truth right away, confirming the deaths of these six. However, as you know, my battle strategy this time is the complete opposite of previous games, and now I'll use red truth starvation tactics. Since you use it as a grounding from which to counterattack, I will not use the red easily. I'll make you come apart at the seams by using red in just a single place as rarely as possible. In the end, it means I will per permit all rants regarding your guesswork for all the closed rooms, and I only have to smash one of those once with the red truth. <laughs> Even though you've always teased me, once I start counterattacking, you now hold up back inside your shell. Quit kidding around. At any rate, I do not want to use the red. I want to be stingy. I want to bully battle it. 
But how could I guarantee a death for certain without using red? I worried and worried over it. Then, Gab gave me an idea. It truly is a simple method. <laughs> I just pointed out something obvious and you hit upon the idea, Richie. I simply said that you only had to create corpses whose identity could be distinguished and whose complete death could be understood. Would be understood. <laughs> In short, I put those two things together. The face, which is necessary to distinguish their identity, and the pulverization of the head, the vessel for the soul, which is the perfect symbol of death. When I put those two parts neatly together, ah, how wonderful. I came up with the perfect answer of corpses with their heads half smashed. I bet you love two-colored bread and two-colored ice cream. You're just like a greedy kid. At any rate, even if half of their heads are smashed, we shouldn't assume that they're dead at this point in time. I get it. Since Beato is trying to act tough and is refusing to say anything in red, we've got to suspect everything. Of course, I'm definitely not going to swallow the theory of magical mass murder by the Chester ass nays chums. <laughs> you, you sure have gotten prudent. If this were the first game, you would have swallowed everything. <laughs> I wouldn't have anything less for, from a rival. Since there is fortunately no red now, he can imagine whatever he wants and reason over and over again as he likes. At the very end, at the very sweetest spot, I'll cut him down at once with the red truth. check, I think. Yes, okay. Huh. Huh. Silent. Black. Cold. Painful. Rosa regained consciousness bit by bit. And the first thing she thought was that it would have been better if she hadn't. After all, with her body this cold and hurting, the pain grew the more that her consciousness returned. It felt like she'd been sleeping on ice-cold marble in the darkness, lying face down for a long time. <sighs> this is why I always tell myself, even if it's just for a nap, got to at least grab a sofa. I know that if I naively try to close my eyes for just a second, and end up sleeping on the floor or in the study chair, it'll hurt my body later and make things difficult. Since I slept on such a cold and hard floor, even my bones are ice cold. Since I slept on such a hard and cold floor, the half of my face pressed down against it hurts a lot. If I were to look in a mirror right now, I'm sure I'd see an embarrassing mark. I didn't think that just rubbing it would make that mark disappear, but I stroked the hurting side of my face anyway, trying to smooth it over. I wonder where this is. I thought it was pitch black, but it looks like it isn't. After all, I can faintly see my own body. Without a doubt, there was some source of light. But even if I looked up at the ceiling, or else the sky, there was only an expanse of blackness and I couldn't see a proper light. My body alone was slightly lit, whereas everything else was sunk in darkness. That's what this world was like. It was almost as though Rosa alone had been abandoned in a forgotten world. As her mind grew clearer, she started getting nervous about why she was all alone in a lonely place like this. When she was about to call out, asking if anyone was there, she heard the patter, patter, of footsteps coming towards her. They were light footsteps, so she thought it was probably a kid. She didn't sense anything disturbing, so she wasn't afraid. But they also weren't Maria's footsteps. So wondering who in the world would be in a darkness like this, 
She stared in the direction the footsteps were coming from. As she did, a faint, approaching silhouette came into view. It looked like a child, much younger than Maria. Who is it? I don't know this kid. But the expression on his face was like a lost child separated from his parents. As a parent with a daughter herself, Rosa felt as though her chest had been torn apart. What are you? <laughs> the instant the kid muttered that infantile word, she felt pain in the half of her face that had started hurting from the cold floor, as though it had been pierced by long, thin, hard needles. Without thinking, she pressed her hand against that side of her face. Are you alright? Does it still hurt? Thanks. I'm fine, little guy. Where are we? It's really cold. Come this way. You mustn't stay here. That child took my other hand and pulled with a grim expression on his face. Rosa didn't have a clue what was going on. However, a single honest expression on the child can often tell the truth better than a hundred wor words from, a, from an adult. She didn't know the situation, but even so, she dashed along with him, still being pulled. But this was a world where nothing could be seen in the darkness except for their own forms. It didn't even really feel like she was moving forwards. Even though she was running, she couldn't even feel any wind. It was as though she was still inside a nightmare, that kind of unreal sensation. So even though I ran, I couldn't maintain my sense of balance, and my legs got tangled and I fell. Even in a world that didn't feel real, the pain of smashing my face against the cold, hard floor was reality itself. Uri, are you okay? Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, my head hurts. When the kid said that infantile word, Uryu, pain like being stuck with needles ran through my head again. Even though it had only happened twice, I was somehow able to understand that the child's word was the cause of my pain. So I said so, frankly. I'm sorry. Could you stop saying Uryu? Uryu. <laughs> Wait a second, didn't I tell you to stop? Uh, 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 sorry. I had the feeling that this child's apology caused a sharp pain in my forehead this time. What is this child? I know there's no malice in him. But when I'm around this child, my head hurts. Are you okay? Let's go, quickly. You mustn't stay here. Why shouldn't I be here? Hey, where is this? Who are you? Where's your mama? The one who made me is you, mama. Huh? That child stared at me with round eyes. This kid's mama is me? Who? Who is this kid? I don't remember at all. Did you forget about me? You made me, right? Wait a second. Stop kidding around. Maria is my only child. That's right. Where's Maria? Where is she? Maria? I suddenly grew nervous about Maria not being there. Why am I all alone in a place like this? Where is Maria? I'm only able to be me because Maria's there for me. Maria's here, but she's not Maria now. It's better if you don't meet with her now. It's better for your sake and Maria's as well. But for Maria's sake as well, escape. Huh? What are you saying? Where is Maria? Maria, answer me. Maria's gonna find you. Come this way, quickly, Mama. 
that child pulled on my hand again. He was probably pulling me in the opposite direction from Maria. So I stopped walking. Let go. Just who are you? What gives you the right to call me Mama? Mama is the one who made me. Did you forget? For Maria's birthday present. You made me with your own hands. Did you forget? You couldn't be. Maria's Sakutaro? Yes. The lion stuffed animal Mama made. Yeah. A fierce, sharp pain struck me. It came from the, pa the palm he had grasped with his hand. When I knocked his hand away without thinking and looked at my palm, a hole the size of a thumb had opened there and deep red blood gushed out. It was a hole so big that I could see through to the other side. What are you... Are you okay? Are you okay? What's wrong? Sakataro noticed my wound and panicked. As far as I could tell by looking at him, he couldn't understand why my hand had sustained a serious injury. But in my eyes, it felt like I'd been injured because he'd grabbed my hand. Regardless of whether there was malice in him, I understood that this child was something that would do harm to me, and he instantly seemed eerie. Go away. You have nothing to do with me. Sakutaro was just a disgusting, crappy stuffed animal, right? I don't know you. I'm not your mama. Go away. Disappear. Slowly, the base of Sakutaro's neck was sliced in a horizontal line. It gaped open, and pitch black insides peeked out. No blood poured from it. Only an empty blackness peeked out. Whoa. Whoa. Then, from the insides of the gash, cotton snow poured out. And as bits of cotton scattered, he slumped over. Then, all that remained was a crumpled yellow cloth and bits of cotton that looked like sticky, crushed cotton candy. A lion stuffed animal. Without a doubt, these were the remains of the Sakutaro stuffed animal I tore apart on that day, while overcome by my emotions. The instant I realized that, a long, sharp shriek that could rupture an eardrum tore the world apart. Ah, Sakutaro! Sakutaro! Like a flood from a broken dam, or like a broken TV, Maria cried out in a high-pitched voice. Her voice, which made the ears throb, brought up two emotions in me. One was, was regret. Yeah, I was overcome by my emotions and went overboard. It was a mother's desire to kneel down right away, hold Maria's head, cry with her, and apologize. In actual fact, I did that right away. I held Maria's head and apologized, crying. But Maria didn't stop crying. On the contrary, she rejected me, the one who had torn her closest friend apart, and pushed me away forcefully with both hands. I had been on my knees in an unnatural position, so I fell backwards easily. Maria scraped together the yellow scraps of cloth and cotton bits, and buried her face in them and cried even more. Watching that, another emotion welled up. It welled up rapidly. And then, it burst. After all, she refused to make up with me even though I'd apologized, and there was nothing else I could do now anyway, and it was all Maria's fault in the first place. Since, since she's too busy playing with stuffed animals all the time like this, she can't make any friends, 
and that's why people treat her like a freak. This is a perfect opportunity to give her some instructive guidance. After all, it's not like I was pampered all the time. Like I was pampered all the time. Everything eventually breaks, is stolen, is destroyed by someone. Even I had lots of toys and treasures stolen, broken, mocked and thrown away by my brothers and sister and father and mother. But when I cried about that, while I might have shed a few tears, not once did I sob like this and trouble my parents. Throw a tantrum, get mad, hit the floor and kick and make a racket. Even though I always wanted to, I thought I'd get in more trouble if I didn't, and so I always, always held it back. It's because I held it back that I was able to become the wonderful adult I am now. At that moment, I felt something strange. The same feeling as when you use a tool recklessly and it finally breaks, so that only the base is left. But I wasn't using a tool. I'd just been repeatedly hitting Maria's head with both hands. So, I looked at my hands. From my wrists onwards, my hands had broken off, splintered, and disappeared. As though only that part of my arms had become ceramic. No. As though all of me, from the wrists onwards, had suddenly become ceramic and had broken and fallen. They must have gotten filled with cracks because I hit Maria too much, before falling off. After all, look, aren't both of my wrists lying smashed by my feet? <laughs> there is no pain. But the shocking sight of my arms breaking off from the wrists onwards made me scream. What is this? What is this? My hands, my hands, my hands! <laughs> this way, you won't be able to hit me anymore. Ignoring my confusion, Maria spoke with an icy voice, slowly moving her hands away from her head, where they had been defending against my barrage. What's happening? My hands! My hands! What did you do, Maria? What is this? What on earth is this? Behind Maria's back, a black silhouette had appeared. It was the silhouette of an adult. Who? If she'd used those hands for patting her daughter's head, flipping through picture books, or making warm meals, it may have been worth leaving them on. Mama hit my head more than she patted it. She never opens picture books. She doesn't even make me food. I go to buy it myself. But I mustn't go to the same store more than once. Mustn't have my face remembered. Mustn't talk to the policeman. Why? Why is that? Is it my fault? Am I not allowed to have Mama pat my head? Have picture books read to me? Or eat dinner with Mama? Why not? Why not? I didn't do anything wrong. It isn't my fault. It's Mama's. Mama's fault. Mama wouldn't play with me, but Sakutaro did. He even read books, watched TV, and ate meals with me. He was a much, much better friend than Mama was. I'm not proud of it. But what am I supposed to do? I'm busy with work. Work, I tell you. You know that, right? It was unavoidable. There's nothing I can do. True enough. It was unavoidable. Unavoidable that you'd injure your daughter, tearing her heart apart and making her tears run with blood. In that case, there's no avoiding the same thing happening again, right here, right now. Come, Maria. Enough of the excuses from a woman who calls herself a mother. Can you forgive her or not? Is she innocent or guilty? I won't forgive her. Mama's guilty. I'll make Mama meet the same fate she gave to Sakutaro. Take Mama from the seam at the neck. And tear her apart so we can see the cotton inside her. 
Maria's eyes ominously flashed blue. In that instant, invisible, massive arms stuck their fingernails out and tightly grasped Rosa's entire body. As the bones all over her body made a sound like twigs being stepped on, they cracked readily and broke apart. Rosa had understood vaguely. The massive arms were probably her own arms from the time she she torn Sakatato apart. From a stuffed animal's perspective, her arms certainly would have been this massive. She could imagine what would happen next. The sharp nails stuck deep into the base of her neck, and she heard the skin tearing with her own ears. Then, as the two witches watched over her, Rosa's flesh was split in two, top and bottom. When Sakutaro had been torn apart, bits of cotton had flown about like snowflakes. But in Rosa's case, something like black, thick tar came out, filthily flying all over the place. There wasn't even a trace of the red of blood. It was something black, filthy, and thick. It was probably what a bloodless, tearless human kept inside their body. This is incredible. Hideous. What filthy insides. Splendidly done, Maria. Well then, is this enough for your revenge? Can you forgive your mother or not? Innocent or guilty? I can't forgive her. Still can't forgive her. She's guilty. When Beatrice brandished her pipe cane, gold butterflies seeped up and restored Rosa's broken flesh in an instant. <laughs> Feel the depths of your sin, which cannot be repaid by a single human life. And remember your own great sin. Come, try and remember. Remember the scale of your sin. Hello? Is it Mama? When will you get home? I'm sorry. I'm busy with work today, so I'm staying over. Staying over for work again? Looks like work is tough for you again today, Mama. Yeah, sorry. I really am busy. I'll be holed up in the company the whole time. I can't even get a breath of outside air. Mama just can't finish her job quickly this time. Unless I give them a better design, I won't be given another job. That's how tough this work is. So it'll just have to take some time. Yeah, I understand. I'll be a good girl and watch over the house. So do your best at work. Finish it quickly and come back. Okay? Thank you for understanding about the last work. I promise I'll buy a delicious cake tomorrow and take it home. I don't need cake. Instead of taking time to go to the cake store, I'd be happier if you came home that much sooner. Don't worry. I'll come back quickly, I promise. So let's have some delicious cake together. Let's drink delicious tea together. Let's read a new picture book together. Let's play with that that wolves and sheep puzzle I bought the other day. Both of us, together. I promise. Yeah, promise. I'll be waiting. Do your best at work, Mama. <laughs> it's a lonely story, but isn't this mother-daughter love wonderful, with both looking out for the other? Do you see any problem with it, Maria? Rosa? Promise, didn't I? The next evening, didn't I do as I promised, buying a cake and returning earlier than usual? That's, that's not it. I knew. That evening. The pay on delivery package came from Mama, but there wasn't enough money in the wallet. So I called Mama's company to ask what to do. I was told only to call at special times. But I thought it'd be bad if the package was something important for Mama's work. So I called. Then, 
I was told that Mama had the day off. I was told that it had been decided long ago that Mama would have that day off and that she'd gone far away to play. I knew. The whole time. The whole, whole time. I knew Mama was lying. But you know what? Sakatoro scolded me, saying it, that it wasn't true. Every day, Mama was very busy with work. There was no way she'd abandon Maria and play. He said that the kind, the person who told us Mama had the day off must have made some kind of mistake. That's what Sakatoro said. So I believed it. I believed it. I love Mama. Love her. Of course, Mama says that she loves me. Oops, loves me. Yes, me too. I love you, Maria. Rosa let out a deep sigh. Maybe she felt the weight of her, wor her words. Then she set the receiver down on the bed. The receiver on the bedside phone down. The dark room made the starry sky on the ground below the window stand out even more beautifully. On the table in front of the terrace was a very cold wine cooler, and the one she shared a glass with was gazing at the scene below. You didn't tell your daughter you were on vacation? I told her once, but she was so noisy that I decided not to tell her anymore. It's less work that way. If you were worried about your daughter, you didn't have to force yourself to put this in your schedule, right? But that way, we'd never get our schedules to match. Didn't I say not to worry about that? The slender, middle-aged man clad in a white robe gave a small sigh. Rosa reacted instantly to that slight action. Come on. Let's not talk about my daughter. It'd be a waste of this precious wine. I find you fascinating as both a human, a woman and a human being. But for that very reason. I feel bad about taking so much of your time that it strained your relationship with your daughter. Don't I always tell you not to worry about my relationship with my daughter? I try not to talk, her about, talk about her when I'm alone with you, okay? I wouldn't even have phoned from here if it weren't for the noisy drunk laughing stupidly in the lobby downstairs. Rosa sighed. Can't you consider reconsider taking sudden vacations like this in the future? For your daughter's sake. Isn't it enough if we only meet when our schedules match? Our schedules will never match up that way, right? And I always want to be with you. That's a child's way of loving. Loving between adults should be a little more stoic. Not being able to be with you for long periods of time makes me lonely too. However, I think we, we can enjoy more than enough adult loving during that limited time. So you're telling me to go be with my daughter more? Be a mother, not a woman? That's what you want too, right? You must also want to spend lots of time with your daughter. I won't run away. I'm trying to say that I think it's sad for you to sacrifice your daughter so you can prioritize your time with me. Did you get back on good terms with your wife? Looks like you've had about enough of being separated from her. I don't want to talk about my wife. Just like you don't want to talk about your daughter. I'm sure you think single women with children are a pain. Never said anything of a sort before. Whenever someone finds out I have a child, they desert me. Even if I tell them not to worry about paying that child's living expenses, they all desert me. I thought you understood about my daughter, but I guess you don't like single women with children after all. That's not what I'm saying. I haven't started to dislike you, Rosa-san. I'm just trying to tell you to take better care of your daughter. Something I know you wish for yourself. And I don't want you to hurt yourself by lying to her. That's all I'm saying. Sorry about the auto mod there. Yeah, she is. She's a dunce. It's a good word. A liar. I've just become a burden for you, right? That's not what I'm saying. No, I know. I understand. After being abandoned so many times because of that child, I know. I can tell by your mood. Yes, you're already like those other men. You don't want a woman with a child. You don't want a divorcee. Because that's a pain. 
You don't want to become the parent of a child made with another man, right? Yes, that's right. I totally get it. I once went out with a man with children, so I really get how you feel. That's why I believe I'd be able to be together with you, a person who understood about my daughter. <laughs> that's right. You were always in the way. If only you didn't exist, I would have been able to grasp my happiness as a woman long ago. Because you exist. You're always in the way of my happiness. Even I didn't want you to be born. No, that's not it. I thought I might be able to build a happy family together with you. But that man disappeared right before your birth. He said he'd build a warm family with me, trick me, and disappear from my sight for all eternity. Only you were left. No love or memories or anything remained. Where did that man go? He probably just turned my days with him into a war memory and met with a new love. And this time, he might have been able to create a happy family. And as for me, I have you. I can't even look for a new love. Men can go between women as they like and brag about it. But for a woman, for me, I have you. I had you as a stone weight. And because of you, I can't search for romance. I can't find love. And I can only live alone. No. I wasn't even allowed that. I wasn't even allowed a night to drink myself drunk all alone. Who are you? Who? You wasted my life. And won't even let me have a new life. Just who are you to my life? Die. Disappear. I've hated you since the moment you were... Since the time you were born. I've hated you since the time you were in my room. I've been doing my best to act like a good mother so that I'd be accepted by the outside world. Yes, I've done my best. As I've watched other women of my generation praise being single, sometimes playing with passion or even being joined with someone in love, I was stuck being both a mother and a woman. Who ever showed appreciation for my efforts? No one admired me. No one praised me. I got what I deserved. Secondhand goods. Divorcees should die. Do you want anyone who's not a virgin? I'm the one who doesn't want anything to do with you, you damn inexperienced virgin brats. I was so desperate. I probably looked like, a, like an easy woman to you. Yes, I was desperate. You probably couldn't imagine how desperate a woman like me, who's still at the age where she wants to know love, was. When I realized that my time was being filled with work and caring for my child, so that I'd probably grow old and end my life still like this. Of course I hate your real father too, but we both share the blame for bringing about that catastrophe. I myself might have been persistent enough to make him turn run away, but the, catas the catastrophes after that were all your fault. When did I ever scold you for that? Never, right? The day after one man left me, when I wanted to drink myself dead drunk was parents day at your school. When I tried to hide my tear stained eyes with heavy makeup, the way I felt when you said something off the mark and the whole class laughed at you, it's something that not only you, but probably everyone in the world couldn't understand. I hate you, loathe you. And until now, I've never, I've never really loved you even once. Uh. Rosa sucks. Maria's face was still stiff, if the words really had been blades. Maria's whole body would probably be stained red with fresh blood by now. Even after gaining the power of a witch and resolving herself to take revenge for Sakotaro, she couldn't stand these curses coming out of her mother's mouth. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly. How ugly is a woman drowning in lust? Now you see this woman's true nature. Even I, as a witch who has explored the depths of evil, find this most difficult to watch. Maria, now is the time to part from her. Smash the ugly lump of meat that calls herself your mother. 
would be pointless for your pure soul to be bound by the chains between mother and daughter any longer. With your own hand, release your own soul now. You have now gained the tooth and claw to protect yourself. Oh. Now you'll taste the pain I had to go through. Now I'll take revenge for those days of suffering. <laughs> Aren't you the one who's been hurting me? I'm the one who wants revenge. I should have done that before you were born. If only you hadn't been born. Disappear. <sighs> As Rosa howled, in a way that can only be described by the word splat, her upper body was crushed, and in an instant became something similar to a wrung, bloodstained towel. Be crushed. I can't forgive you. I can't forgive you. <laughs> what film? That form suits you. Even though Rosa's waist was below and below was standing normally. Just the upper half of her body had been pinched, and that extreme contrast was bizarre. Then, she fell over, but the instant she fell, her body was restored. <laughs> you die. <laughs> Come, Maria. Is this the limit of your anger and sadness? Now is the time for revenge. Time for the settlement of anger and sadness. Hit her, spit it out. Push out all the wedges driven into your chest and fling them back at her. <sighs> Maria's howl was adorned with the ugly sound of flesh and bone being crushed at the same time. As Rosa, who had foully insulted Maria, lay spread eagle, a neat, perfect circle was cut out of her chest and crushed, as though her chest had been trampled by an invisible elephant. Her heart and her lungs and her ribs were trampled so mercilessly that they were completely indistinguishable. It might have symbolized the pain of Maria's heart up until today. So, Maria, are you satisfied now? Can you forgive your mother for her sin? Or not? Innocent? Or guilty? I can't forgive her. Not yet. Not yet. Mama's guilty. 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 Can't forgive her. Indeed. How could this level of punishment compare to the bitter days you suffered through? Know it, Rosa. Come. Try to remember. What form did you have? Revive in order to be killed. Be killed over and over, so that your sins can be purified. As Beata waved her cane, the body was restored again, and Rosa sat up, coughing violently in apparent pain. And once again, she spat out curses rejecting Maria. You are Mama. You're a witch. A witch tormenting me and Mama. I won't forgive you just because you look like Mama. I won't forgive you. You're the witch, aren't you? Always reading creepy books and pretending to play with witches. You're the one who should disappear. Because of you, even I'm treated like a freak. Because of you. Because of you. If only you hadn't been born. Don't be born. I've hated you since before you were born. Ah. Maria screamed. Was she unable to bear her anger and sadness? Or else had she been taken over by an indescribable emotion? It was surely a cry of hopelessness. And yet, it was a reality that had to be accepted. Maria knew. She knew that she was thought of as a burden. But even though she herself had known that, she didn't believe it. She believed that her mother loved her had done her best to positively interpret several events that could have made her doubt this, trusting and clinging to her mother's love. But she had no one except Mama. Even so, she really did like Mama, and wanted her to return to the days when she believed that Mama loved her. So I howled. I'll erase all of it. I won't accept it. I'll deny it. 
and deny the mother who says these things, the black witch who makes her say them, and the part of myself that can't forgive my mother. But I can't deny it. This is reality, fact, the truth, the answer. Without any mistake, this is absolute reality. Maria turned Rosa into a lump of meat over and over. Over and over, in the dark world that reflected her heart, rang the ugly sound of flesh and bone being torn apart, which would make anyone want to cover their ears. Each time, Beatrice revived Rosa. She dragged her back into the world of endless torture, which could not be escaped from, even by death. This was the true, deepest hell that the endless witch Beatrice could create. However, this world was not made endless by Beatrice's will, because every time Rosa returned into a lump of meat, she asked the same question to Maria. <laughs> Are you satisfied, Maria? Can your anger forgive your mother yet? How could I forgive her? How could I forgive her? I won't forgive, won't forgive her. I'll teach you all of my pain, teach you much, much more still not enough, not close to enough. Since I was born, since before I was born, I can't get rid of the anger and sadness of being neglected for so long. <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> ah. Revive over and over again. Return to a me meat lump over and over again. In various ways, she crushed, smashed, beat, and tore to bits. Flying blood sp spatter and flesh turned the once pitch black world into a world with mixed red and black. Maria's anger still hadn't calmed down. Welcome back. It was as though she was spitting out all the suppressed rage from the time of her birth until today. But that all became poison to her heart. Then would the repeated murder of her mother purify her soul? Would even this wasteful murder save her soul, even a, at least a little bit? This endless torture might have become a slight diversion from her sad, unrewarded life. After all, it seemed that she'd finally been able to regain her smile. Learn it. You, the source of my unhappiness. Learn it. Learn that what you're feeling is nothing compared to my pain. <laughs> What's wrong? Why'd you stop laughing? Try and laugh. <laughs> Half of her, of her skull collapsed. Eyeballs flew out and black cranial fluid gushed. Fragments of teeth scattered. Come on, revive. Try and laugh. Come on, come on. <laughs> her whole chest along with her ribs turned inside out, exposing her filthy innards. All of them writhed like some kind of impure creature. Come on, come on, come on. Revive. Can you still laugh? Can you still laugh? <laughs> Rosa couldn't laugh anymore, but her face was laughing. It was filled with a twisted laugh and covered with a malice that rejected her unwanted daughter. I erase that laughing voice. Next, I'll erase that laughing face. I'll erase it, I'll crush it, I'll tear it to bits. Maria, you're scaring me. Wow. Um, that's terrifying. Laugh. Try and laugh, Mama. <laughs> What's wrong, Mama? Let's wake up, read a picture book, and go take a walk. Let's say we love each other. Make a promise for next Sunday. Let's go shopping. Let's go to the movies. And of course you'll break that promise. <laughs> Isn't it fun, Mama? Isn't it fun, Mama? I'm playing with Mama now, right? 
<laughs> That's right. You are now playing with your mother, having fun with her. Tell me how you feel right now. I don't believe it's anger, or sadness, or pain. Yeah, that's right. I get it, Beatrice. I'm having a lot of fun right now. I'm playing with Mama, so it's tons of fun. And even though I'm killing Mama over and over again, she can be revived with just a single bit of magic. I took care of my toys because I couldn't fix them if they broke. But if the toy could be fixed, I'd want to break it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but Sakatoro won't be fixed. He can't be fixed. Because Mama who made him. Mama who gave birth to him. Won't acknowledge him. I wasn't acknowledged by Mama either, was I? So the broken Maria won't be fixed either. <laughs> ah, it's fun. It's fun, Mama. Since it's gotten so fun, I'm somehow starting to feel that I could forgive you. Hey, Beato. This is a very strange feeling. Why? Why am I starting to feel like I can forgive Mama? That enlightened state is only reached by witches who have gained the power to control life and death at will. You can kill at any time. You can revive her if needed. If that's a pain, then it's alright to kill her again. Once you've learned that you can do this at any time by simply snapping your fingers, all nonsense spoken in the world of humans becomes a chirping of insects that isn't worth listening to. You didn't begin to think about forgiving your mother because her eyes were open to your mother's love. It was because now, you stand at the entrance to the world of true witches. Welcome, Maria to the profound and sweet world of witches. I've done it. Maria is no longer Maria. I may still be an apprentice, but I've surpassed the human world. I am now the apprentice witch of origins, Maria. There's nothing to frustrate me, nothing to make me sad. Mama, I'll forgive you. I'm sure I can forgive you. I think I'll be able to forgive you after doing just a bit more. After all, I'm a witch. Maria would probably forgive her mother, eventually. After brutally murdering her, countless times. Graciously. Yep, that was a lot of, uh, ee uh, That is the second time, so far, that Maria has scared the ever-living daylights out of me because, uh, of the CGs that I've never seen before because of the P3 mod. I like her, but wow, wow, she's scary. And, yeah, same, I was so spooked. And I was hoping that it wouldn't stay on the screen for, like, a long time, but it, it did. It did. Um. Gosh, okay. <laughs> it hung around with the smell of Kinzo's room, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, gosh. Ooh. I- I was... I know that I made the stream title, you were not prepared for this episode. I was not prepared for this episode. 
that, uh, that spooked me. And it gets better because I actually checked which scene would be coming up next, but I apparently missed one. So I had no clue. I thought we were going to get something else. <laughs> I was not ready. Um. Wow. I actually also totally forgot that that scene exists somehow. Like for most of the scenes, I, I remember them vaguely or in, in detail, depending. This one, I... No, totally forgot that that was in the game. Um, I'll, I'll have to put an extra little content warning in the YouTube video. Because, uh, yeah. That got pretty gruesome at points. More so than I expected. Um, all right. I've been going for a while. I think this is a good stopping point. Um, so I'm gonna we're gonna continue this next week. I hope you enjoyed it. I I did. I had a great time with this episode. Um, and now we have Gap, a legend. Just. It's weird. I actually... I like Gap a lot. I think that was obvious. I kind of forgot how much I like her. But then when she showed up, it was instantly like, Ah yes, I love you. I remember now. <laughs> I... Whenever I think of her name, I think of the big gap in her clothes. It's just Gap, Gap. It makes sense. Um, I think maybe it's pronounced more like... God, like you need to extend the A, but it's I don't, I don't know how to talk, so I just don't. Um, <laughs> or, or the gap in her head. The, yep, that she should put in there according to Anja. Um, but yeah. Um, if 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 you're like theorizing and trying to follow along and stuff, and trying to solve the big overlapping mystery, the the overarching mystery, there is a lot in this episode, a surprising amount. This gives a lot away. It's not gonna be super obvious, but there's there's some there's some lore being dropped. There's some hints. And, yeah, have fun with that. <laughs> I sadly already know everything that happened, so I can't do that anymore. If I could erase this game from my brain and play it again, I would. I really, really would, but, you know. Um, if you do have theories, you're always welcome to drop them in the chat or in the comments if you're watching the YouTube video. Or you can go into my Discord, I fixed the invite. It works now. <laughs> In case you tried it and it didn't work. Um, and you can, we, there's a I mean, echo channel, uh, we can theorize in there. I will not confirm or deny anything you tell me to avoid spoilers. <laughs> but it's fun to talk about. Um, and I love hearing what people think. It's, it's so much fun. Um, Especially because, you know, I, I still remember all my old theories from when I played this for the first time. And comparing that is, is neat. Okay. Um, thank you, as always, for watching. Uh, whether you're just dropping by or hanging out or whether you're in the, ch the chat, you know. <laughs> all your old th theories have been shattered. Oh no. That's part of the fun, though, right? It's... You offer up a theory, and then Beatrice comes along and like smashes it out of your hand, and you come up with something else, like Battler does. It's in the spirit of the game. But what that does mean is you haven't stopped thinking, which is the best way to read this game, is to try to figure it out while you're while you're experiencing it. It 
it can be really hard to keep up because there's so much, so much going on. But yes, thank you all so much. I appreciate you all. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, next week is gonna also be amazing. There's some. Episode four is one of the. Mm, I don't want. Mm, is it one of? Yes, it's one of the best. But they're all really good. <laughs> I feel like by saying this one's the best, I'm dunking on all the other ones. But it's really good. I really enjoy it. There's actually going to be some funny bits coming up. I'm looking forward to those. It's it's not going to be all like miserable and spooky from here. There's going to be lighter moments, so look forward to those as well. And yeah, I'm going to put this on YouTube as quick as I can. I'm going to do that faster now. It worked last time I managed. Um, so I hope that 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 I can keep that up. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna be back on Monday with I Am Dead. We're gonna bark at more ghosts. Hey, that, that, that's, that's the game. That's what you do in the game. One of the things, but it's the funniest sounding, so that's what I always mention. And then we're gonna be back next week, Wednesday. 10 p.m. GMT plus 2 with Alliance of the Golden Witch. And I hope you're going to be there. If not, we're going to have VODs, as always, YouTube videos, the works. And until then, have a great night, have a great day, have a great week. Thank you for being here, and see you next time. Bye-bye.